Please welcome the panel on Opportunities for All. Good morning. It's my uh, great uh, honor to uh, moderate this panel with uh, Tammy Bruce on my far left and Harmeet Dillon here in the middle. Uh, Tammy is the president of Independent Women's Voice, a uh, radio, uh, radio host, a Washington uh, examiner. Times. I'm sorry, Washington Times. I'm ready wrong. Uh, it's <laughs> happened a lot today. Washington Times columnist and a frequent Fox News uh, contributor and guest host. Uh, Hi, everybody. To my left is uh, Harmeet Dillon, who uh, is one of, I can say, one of San Francisco's great conservative civil rights attorneys and also uh, often on Fox News. Uh, I feel like the host on a Fox News show right now, actually, uh, being next to two uh, distinguished, attractive, smart women. Uh, is that that show outnumbered? Is that what it's called, where they stick some poor sucker guy you're, in the middle and they beat there. the hell yeah. out of him? Yeah. Um, and one last programming note, a lot of you asked me uh, during the breaks, but no, my mom is not here with me. Um, those who've been on the cruise know I like to bring my mom to NR events because she's a geriatric psychiatrist. And so I have thought, I always think these events are great for the family business. <laughs> but after yesterday's panel with the millennial, I was like, we gotta move into the millennial psychiatry business, mom. That's where we're gonna make the big bucks. So uh, our uh, topic today is uh, opportunity for all or identity politics. And so I wanted to start out, uh, me with Harmeet first, and ask, uh, what is identity politics? How have you uh, confronted it? And do you see it in tension or conflict with the, I think, age-old American idea of opportunity for all? Yeah, absolutely, John, great question. So John mentioned that I'm a civil rights attorney, and over the past few years, I've had the opportunity to confront this issue in many different ways. But as an immigrant to this country, you know, my background is coming from India. We came from a culture where uh, people were stratified according to how they were born, what, what caste they were in, uh, what gender, uh, what part of the country. Um, and one of the reasons my parents left India was to escape that culture of being trapped according to circumstances beyond one's control. And so the great American um, experiment was to really free us from those types of bonds. And it took time for all of those bonds to be broken down and addressed. But ultimately, I think that did happen. And we'll talk about that some more. But what we see today in schools and in workplaces and in boardrooms and in politics is uh, a return to that, uh, what I think is kind of a regressive concept of people being awarded spoils according to uh, immutable characteristics um, or choices, and, uh, and then being a zero-sum game in academia, politics, uh, the workplace. Only one person can get that promotion. Only one person can you know, be the, the person who wins the election. Uh, only one person can be the chairman of the board. Then the, the losers in that, uh, in that competition are increasingly being forced into this ritual of self-abnegation. Um, I think Peggy Noonan had a great piece recently about the, um, the identity politics reminding her of the Cultural Revolution in China, where uh, the elders are being forced to wear dunce caps and apologize for being educated, for being successful, for being wealthy. Um, we saw Joe Biden the other day who dared to praise uh, Mike Pence, having to quickly have to apologize for hurting the feelings of LGBT people who project on him some kind of hatred that most of us who know him don't see that. So I think that's what we're seeing. And, and why, why should that bother us? I mean, people here are all doing fine in, in the world. But in education, uh, I represent Berkeley College Republicans recently in a lawsuit at Berkeley. Uh, Thank, to, thanks for that, by the way. And thanks for the attorney fees, John. Um, but okay, students at the Berkeley, case, the students case, yeah. at Berkeley, conservative students at Berkeley, um, you know, young, um, normal people, were trying to bring 
we're trying to bring conservative speakers onto the campus. And the, the, the problem, obviously, is that they're not seeing any conservative speakers in their classrooms. They're not allowed to utter conservative speech openly. And so their only exposure to those ideas is by importing speakers off the campus. I mean, John is one of the rare exceptions there of a professor who is openly conservative. Um, and so- Oh, she just outed me. <laughs> I think everybody knows John. Uh, it's my decision to, to make, isn't it? Sorry to tell you. <laughs> sorry to tell you, but, um, but you know- in, You've in been the, triggered. In, <laughs> and, in different spheres of our life, it's actually coming at, at, at different times. So I think, actually, to be fair to Berkeley, which I've been an advisor to the Berkeley College of Republicans for many years, they were actually pretty open to conservative speakers on the campus up until Trump won the election in 2016. And all of a sudden, the tolerance kind of evaporated. And so when the Berkeley College Republicans tried to bring um, Milo Yiannopoulos to come speak on the campus in February 2017, David Horowitz to come speak on the campus in April, and then Ann Coulter, to come speak on the campus in April, university uh, shut down and said, you know, basically banned them. And I mean, the details are, are well known and out there and would not let these people speak. And so we filed this federal civil rights lawsuit and uh, were able to ultimately force Berkeley to change its policy. And now Berkeley does not do any of those things that we sued over. But, but the point is the Berkeley College Republicans had a lawyer nearby and I'm a lawyer who's willing to file a lawsuit like that. This type of situation is happening on every college campus in America and uh, there are not lawyers standing by to help. So the, the damage that's being done to young people is, first of all, if they're conservative, they have to internalize that. They can't say it publicly. They're not exposed to ideas. And, um, and the liberals and the professors and the students are running roughshod. And, and, and the liberal students are damaged by this as well, because they're not exposed to any conservative ideas or dialogue. And so the whole educational system is being corrupted by this. So that's one way that I see this happening. Tammy, what about you? How have you seen uh, or confronted this rise of identity politics in your own work, and how is it coming into conflict with this idea of opportunity for all? Well, it's great to be here. Uh, many of you know my background. I was the president of the National Organization for Women in Los Angeles in the 1990s. I am a, previously a, a, a left-wing community organizer. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's great to be in this room. I uh, am a conservative, uh, and that has, uh, interestingly, my politics has not changed. And that's part of what's important here. When it comes to identity politics, just as a uh, perspective, people are saying, well, you know, what's bad about that, right? I mean, it's the individual that matters. And then some point to the civil rights movements. But that's the opposite of what is happening today. The civil rights movements were demands, let's say the black and uh, gay and lesbian civil rights movements, were demands to not be treated differently because of who we are, right? It was demands to be treated as everyone else. Identity politics is the demand for special accommodation specifically because of who you are. So it rips that away. It is, it is demands for isolation, for spaces based on race, right? Safe spaces for, for white people to leave a college for a day as an example, uh, for individuals to be afforded special accommodations, special rights, special benefits, as some kind of acknowledgement of uh, past uh, uh, either uh, negative experiences, past uh, social injustice, et cetera. But the argument, of course, in the civil rights movement and the classical liberal argument is that, in fact, all of us do better when we are treated, at least have access to the same justice system, to the same rules, to the same benefits <laughs> that everyone else has. That, that the civil rights movements were necessary because people already, it was the manifestation effectively, it was the rejection of identity politics, where white individuals were able to eat and stand and do different things, take the bus, sit in particular places because of their identity. So we are now in the absolute opposite of what the civil rights movements were, uh, it, projected by individuals who claim association with the same political framework. That is a lie. It is completely different. So for, for the general basis is, is the identity, whether it's your sexual identity, a religious identity perhaps, racial, ethnic background, right? Uh, sexuality, gender, et cetera. That because of the sliver of who you are, that makes you separate and different, and that's the thing that matters. It is a hyper-personalization of politics. 
And the reason the left likes this is because it keeps, it's, it doesn't uh, bring you together as a group like the traditional political framework of finding things that work together for the community, um, but it requires division. Because the moment you decide that your gender or your race is better or more important or has special issues or special injustice, it means you are immediately in conflict with people who are not like you. So immediately, even members of your own family are a problem. Uh, perhaps even somebody who you're married to or, or one of your best friends or it, it requires divisions in the community. And of course, my first book is, is from 2001 called The New Thought Police. Watching this, it's not new, but watching this unfold, the idea that if you think differently, you're also a problem, right? That you, political correctness, that you can't say certain things because that's gonna upset someone else. It requires, the moment it becomes dangerous to speak about something, it becomes dangerous to think about it. And if you can begin to stop people from feeling comfortable to challenge a status quo or to challenge a prevailing idea, then yes, all communication ends. We're now seeing that, of course, being the standard on campus, as Harmeet has described. So we, on the left, part of the argument is, of course, um, is that when you can't win, we knew that we couldn't win on the details of the issues. Our issues were based in the emotional impact of what was happening and our own personal a sense of uh, uh, being abused or, or a personal sense of injustice. And why would you want to have to argue about that in the detail? Because that, that means that it's about the issue, that it's not about you personally. And the only way to win that argument is to make sure no one else is comfortable speaking about it. And what we relied on, as I, as I look in this room and I, I can't uh, say this uh, strongly enough. We relied on conservatives believing us, not pushing back. We relied on you believing that you were racist, sexist, or homophobic. We relied on that question because you, you I mean, a lot of people are accusing you of this, um, that you would accede this higher ground to the left, that maybe there is, maybe they do have a better moral position they do not. It's a fraud. We've seen it now unfold. The quality of life for individuals who they say that they represent and champion had continually declines. The condition in the inner cities continually declines. The nature of the quality of our lives and what we look forward to is now based in hopelessness. That is the organizing framework. Uh, and the conservative ideal, of course, uh, which I adhere to, and interestingly enough, always did, uh, without knowing it, is the fact that the individual does matter, right? That our individual experiences matter. It's not about even being post-racial. It's about being post-racialist. It's about all of our experience matter. Your experience as an Asian man, your experience as an immigrant woman who's dark, my experience as a gay woman who's out, that our life experience do shape who we are but it blends into the nature of the power of the American experiment, right? This is the power of the American experiment. This ability for all of us to identify initially as, as American first, recognizing that our success is everyone else's success and that we can bring that for everyone else. But, but what I'd wanna close with when it comes to the issue of identity, as, as I look at this room and I see conservatives, um, it, it's important, it's Im just vital and, and existential uh, for all of you to reject the arguments that someone else has the moral high ground, to reject the accusations that are made against you, that are made to silence you so that you will not challenge their, their underlying basis arguments, which is that you, you don't understand other people's lives or that you're, you're inherently homophobic or inherently sexist. You should respond to it as if someone called you a cocker spaniel. <laughs> Would you immediately look behind you to see if there was a tail? <laughs> now maybe it, it would be fun, I suppose, but you would not take that seriously, would you? You would not take it seriously. You wouldn't worry that you were a cocker spaniel. You wouldn't suddenly wonder if you've got to keep your inner cocker spaniel hidden. It's not true. All of this is based on a, a, a manipulation and a lie 
So that, and this is why, again, the, then the, the uh, identity politics becomes the framework. It reinforces that daily, and you accede ground, you accede arguments, you do remain silent. The only way, and I think this is where President Trump comes in, is the ability to say, wait a minute, we do care about everyone, our policies do lift everyone up, that it is about immigration for all in a fair framework, that it is about women doing better and people of color doing better because Americans will be doing better, while still addressing unique issues that we all face. Uh, if you are on the fringes, if you are minorities, uh, and, and th this is the larger argument, but it must reject this, this initial framework of political correctness, that if you, you are conservatives and you say certain things that trigger people or that are going to be declared as racist or sexist or homophobic, then you won't say those things, you won't engage in the argument, you will stand to the side. Uh, it's important for you to return to this environment so that this reformation can continue, where, uh, as we've seen with President Trump's policies, where everyone is doing better, and then we can, of course, then continue to engage in the special issues that particular, particular sections of society do face, and that we can have larger conversations, learn about more of what we have in common, and more of how we can, uh, well, we do this at Independent Women's Voice, Mo most conservative organizations do this, that these issues transcend partisan politics, that this is the core of the American experiment, that this is the core of why we succeed and have become the greatest nation on earth, because everyone is a part of it. The left is trying to undo that, and this is the generation uh, and the next uh, six to 10 years that will help us reverse the damage they've done. Thank you. So um, if this is the way the world is now, uh, it's hard to believe in the mid-90s, California, by large majorities, voted to ban the use of race and affirmative action in the universities. A number of other states did as well. So I'd say as recently as the 90s, this American ideal, this American exceptionalism that uh, your race, gender, your identity doesn't matter, uh, was still, I would say, the norm in our country. And now, in just 20 years, it has uh, been completely replaced by this multicultural identity politics ideal. How did this happen? Who's responsible? Um, what are the critical moments? That, I mean, this is a remarkably fast change as things go. How did how do we get to this point? Well, I mean, um, so I mentioned the academia. I don't think anyone needs to room is surprised that there's been this Marxism trend and movement and nihilism in our academy for many years, but. Uh, you mentioned California. I, I call San Francisco, where I live and I practice law, the utopian, utopian petri dish of uh, the, the United States because well, there's a lot of every, bacteria. Uh, every there's Francisco. a lot of bacteria on the streets. Yes, you yeah. could definitely start a culture just stepping outside your door. But, but you know, incubate these leftist crazy issues, and then they become state law, and then they propagate to other states, and they infect everything. So that. Marxism fashion that we have in our academy, actually you know, Camille Paglia and others like that have commented that feminism in the 1970s was beginning to exhibit these Stalinist tendencies of um, you know, the movement turning upon itself and, 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 and devouring itself and devouring older people in the generation. We're seeing that now in other walks of life. So the same mentality that's infecting our um, colleges and universities most recently, California just passed a law that uh, large corporations have to have uh, female representation on their boards as a matter of law. Well, you're going to see that happen in other states. You're going to see that happen. Um, and and that, that comes from this entitlement mentality in the culture of spoils. I mean, normally you would have this, we both went to Ivy League colleges and then, you know, you and, and, and we out. actually took tests to we get in. We actually took tests to get in, and my parents were not wealthy. They didn't bribe anybody to get me into Dartmouth. And, um, and, um, oh, well, Dartmouth. I mean. Well, you know, <laughs> safety school, safety school. I know I've, I've never been able to live that down. But, um, but people outgrow it typically, right? When you get out into the workforce, you know, we had to actually uh, work in law and work as, as people responding to deadlines and, and so forth. But these, what happens now in schools is they're coddled with this mentality and then they get out in the workforce. I'll give you the example of Google. Google is another 
defendant in a lawsuit that I have against uh, uh, Google for its employment practices. So these young people leave these good institutions of higher learning and then they go into the workforce in these tech companies and they, they have the same mentality. Like, uh, oh my, you know, I, I'm entitled to not be spoken to disrespectfully. I'm entitled to not um, be, um, be, be triggered by things that are said. I'm entitled even in my work to project that and make sure that, uh, that Google and Google search is a safe space for people and you're not gonna search and find things that are offensive. And so you then have a culture in a corporation, the you know, perhaps most powerful corporation of all time, where from the boardroom on down, uh, it is forbidden. Um, James Damore was fired for pointing out that there are differences between men and women that affect how they interact in the workplace and that good HR policies that want to try to promote women in the workplace have to first account for the fact that there, these are differences. Now, everybody in this room knows this is true, yet he was fired for saying this. He was fired for speaking the truth. And then not only was he fired, but before he was fired, humiliated, hounded, punished, and then uh, you know, the subject of national scorn. And to this day, he has had to move, you know, sort of keep a low profile. He's living in a different state because he's subject to death threats for stating these truths. So you know, this is coming to other states besides California. In San Francisco, this is just another day. Uh, we have a lawsuit against Twitter for a radical feminist who dared to challenge uh, the transgender orthodoxy that says that whatever you feel that morning is who you are and don't you dare call me by my dead name. So Twitter bounced this person off in violation of their own rules and so now there's a lawsuit over that. So this mentality has slowly seeped into the boardrooms, into the classrooms, into the, um, into the programming spaces, and into, into our social media, which is now the way many of us communicate. And I think in, in my personal unpacking of this is, I think uh, Tammy is correct, that there is this sort of white guilt, sort of white liberal guilt, white conservative guilt, uh, male you know, guilt, and so people who are being accused of oppressing others, they're accepting it because we're Americans, we're great people, we don't want to be the bad guys who are doing bad things to people, and so this guilt is enabling, this false guilt is enabling this culture of spoils, this culture of uh, demagoguery, um, this culture where everybody's now being defined regressively by how they were born and who they are, or how they identify, and I think it's very destructive. C can and so I, I add to that? Because I think this is an important segue here, that there is a responsibility for conservatives, and I'm, I'm a Democrat registered in California, uh, and I know and that, that- And that makes you special. There you go, it does. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to trigger I, I, you, I, I, but- I want a ribbon. I, want I a have ribbon some for news that. for you, Tammy, yeah. but anyway. There's um, only 36 million others that I just what's, like you. <laughs> What's important for all of, for the people in this room, and part of the duty and responsibility, is to stop abandoning certain groups of people in this country. When President Trump held the gay flag, the first presidential candidate, the Republican candidate to do so, people were, were shocked. Uh, when he did de deliberate and direct vocal outreach to the African American community, it was like, what? There, there is this presumption that certain people uh, belong to or because the left says that they're the champions for these groups, whereas in fact we know what's going on in those lives. We know they're being destroyed. It is imperative that we say enough is enough. And part of the argument about the, the silencing is that the, the, the condemnation of young people, li young liberal people who have arguments to make are not being taught how to make those arguments even. So, so this interests all of us, regardless of what, for those watching on C-SPAN and around the world online, that you think that this is good because those people, it's, they're, they're less than us, they don't know what they're talking about, we don't need to talk to them. That's not real life. When you come out of college, you've got, if your idea is so fabulous, like the Green New Deal, what's the problem with talking about it and getting into the details and being able to defend it you must be able to defend your ideas. And right now, the left has set up their own constituency. And now a generation's worth of 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, who are so unfamiliar with the idea of confronting people with a different framework, they don't know how to defend their idea. And the country, we're looking at now people coming out who are supposed to be running our businesses, going into to politics, 
uh, going into law who do not understand the value of being able to, and once you're able to defend your idea, and sometimes your ideas will have to change, but it's about being able to refine how it is we think as Americans, and this is why now each sector of American society is in such risk because of the, who's being turned out from these universities that are it's so horribly destroying the, 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 the power of the American mind that we rely on these disparate ideas and being able to have these conversations. And, and the other element is media, that one of the big changes in the last generation is the explosion, of course, of media. Uh, and the one entity that actually has a variety of ideas presented, which is Fox News, of course, is the singular threat. Because it is a reminder every day that you can think differently, that there are other arguments out there that one can have. Uh, and yet, um, uh, that is for, for the reasons I've described uh, the threat. But I think that that mass communication, and now through is the work that Harmeet is doing, through this new uh, level, this new medium of, of the internet, uh, plays a part in the perpetuation that there's only one way to think, other ideas are threatening, other ideas have to be banned, you're gonna be censured if you're, if you're gonna represent an idea we've determined to, to be threatening to another group. Like dead naming, how many of you know what dead naming is? Okay. It is calling a, a transgendered person by, by their other gender's name that they had. Like calling Caitlin um, uh, Bruce Jenner. That now in England, people. It's a crime. Are, uh, so it's a crime. It's a crime. And, and so, but you know, all of these Another threads, reason not so to go many, to England. Another reason not to go to England. Along with the there's food so many, there's, there's and Brexit so many. and the, so we, the we, Charlie we, Cooks from there. Yeah. And <laughs> lots of reasons not to go to Britain. I mean, we, we take the First Amendment for granted in the United States, but it is the exception in the world and not the norm. And we do <clears> not protected enough. And I've seen a lot of conservatives fall, fall, um, fall victim to this shaming mentality. I mean, the rise of social media, which I think is very important in spreading ideas, has also been very instrumental in shutting out certain ideas, and I think dangerously so. And um, I, one thing that uh, you didn't mention, John, is in addition to being a lawyer, I'm also a you know, Republican National Committee woman, so a member of the RNC. And from that point of view, politically, I see it as very dangerous for conservatives to cede these concepts to the left. They're not just simply speech or noise, and, and, there, and it's, it is not an answer to this rise of this demagoguery to say, well, if you don't like Twitter, or you don't like Facebook, or you don't like Google, uh, we have a marketplace of ideas and go to the market and find another medium to express yourself. That's false. That is not true. Good point. And there is no market right now. There is a monopoly power of these media, and these media are being harnessed to deliver these messages to people and drowning out those voices. And if we allow this to perpetuate, we will not have conservative voices heard in those new media in 2020, and we will lose every single election going forward. And this is a critical fact that we really need as conservatives to wake up to and understand because, um, because there will be real world consequences to ceding our First Amendment and our, not just First Amendment, but our free speech rights in this workplace and this uh, academia and in every aspect of our lives. Well, let me um, <clears throat> bring us to the question I think you've both uh, moved towards, which is uh, what can we do about it? What's the agenda going forward to try to restore the, uh, you know, which is called the American ideal of equal opportunity? How do you fight back against the attacks we see on identity politics? Um, Tammy several times mentioned uh, who, uh, a man whom I call Big Orange. Um, <laughs> Is what he's doing, is that successful? Is that the way to fight back? That's not nice, That's, John. That's uh, I'm triggering. Tenured. I, I triggered. I can say whatever I want. I am I'm triggered a tenured a professor. RNC member. I'm very triggered by that. But, <laughs> but what, what, is, is, is yeah. that what you do? Is it Donald Trump and the way he fights back the answer? Or would you do uh, something different well, to get it, the it, culture changed it, it, back? It's it multi-front, isn't it? It's not one individual. Uh, but there are people and situations that are emblematic and signs <clears throat> about what the American people want, uh, what we're hoping for. Uh, the average Democrat also uh, remembers what the civil rights movements were about. And every, people are afraid in this country. You're afraid. It's not just like, oh, is this appropriate? People are afraid to speak back. 
this is why some of the things are, can be kind of shocking. Sometimes talk radio can be shocking. Sometimes uh, what the president uh, says or tweets can be shocking. But isn't that interesting? That somebody with a style that maybe is not your style or you think maybe, is some, uh, maybe can be abrasive or just kind of surprising, it creates such disruption when the work of this person is, is changing just th this country in an extraordinary way, but also as a result, uh, the point of view of the world and the idea that, that things can in fact get better and that we're not stuck in a status quo uh, that is leading us down a road where, uh, as we were told, that the new, uh, the new uh, world order, uh, the new normal during the Obama years was that everyone was, had two jobs delivering pizza and get used to it and the government's gonna have to take care of you. All right, that was a lie. It certainly is a lie for this country, uh, and Europe is finding out also the hard way that it was a lie. Uh, but for the fighting back, it has to start in our own minds. And what I just can't encourage you enough is that the left still believes that you will do nothing, that what all the attacks on the president are actually atta and the attacks on Harmeet, the attacks on someone like me or Tucker Carlson, who you're going to hear from shortly, or anyone else, are really messages to you that if you do this, look at what we're doing to these individuals, this can happen to you. As an Ameri the American sensibility is, is to stand up for what we know is right. So it has to manifest as individuals. Conservatives, uh, uh, certainly conservative women, conservative men, uh, it is the, uh, the elevation of this country, how we've become better people, has happened through years of us working on these issues that we know need to be worked on. But they can only become better, and we can only become better people when we can have these conversations. The left wants to shut that down because they, they rely on the division and, and you thinking your neighbor is the enemy. Uh, it is the individuals watching this, conservatives around this country and in this room in particular, uh, to realize that in fact you are not the interloper. Right? They're, they're a, they've fraudulently framed, created a framework that removes you from the scene, but that can only happen if you do so willingly. So it's an individual acknowledgement that, wait a minute, and this is what the president does, wait a minute, um, I can talk about this, I can have an opinion, I'm going to make sure people know what I think about now the, what we know is the hoax of Russia collusion. He was ridiculed and maligned all the time for defending himself. Look, he's saying it again, there's no collusion. Funny enough, there was no collusion. What do you know? And, but that willingness to stand up publicly and to use formats like social media is also a new element that works. Uh, and, and I think that it's also the media, of, you know, he also has pushed back on the media. Creating a, a, a new look at the nature of how we speak to each other if being honest is okay, because it must be, uh, and the change that can come with that. Legal elements are important as this well. Is, this is not get off. We, we've got some, no, we've got some more questions, time, I agree. Yes. But, but those in the, in the legal field, people like Harmeet and John in the, in the academia, defending those individuals and, and not seeding the academy. We've, to say the least, it's where our future leaders come from. And I do know personally, in speaking at colleges, that there are kids who come into my speeches ready to throw things. And there have been protests. After a two-hour speech, just coming from my background, nothing miraculous, these kids come up to me, tell me what they were planning, and shake my hand. These are seniors after four years at a university, major universities in the country, being, being enlightened, being changed, because it's the first time they may have heard a certain argument. These are the things that we have to do personally. Support the media that has a variety of ideas. Support individuals like Harmeet and others in the legal field who are uh, doing this. Uh, uh, Mr. Janus, uh, the, the awardee last night. Individuals and having an infrastructure that allows those individuals, regardless of their politics, to know that there's somewhere they can go to be supported. That's the, the job of the conservative movement. Uh, it's the job of Americans everywhere, and part of it exists, but you must stop believing that you are what they accuse you of being. Can I just... Uh, I was going to quickly address the, the question, John. I do think that 
Donald Trump is the correct man for this time. And I think many of us in this room supported various people in the 2016 election cycle. Um, ultimately, it became clear to me as a lifelong Republican activist that uh, the left is playing by different rules. They're playing by their Stalinistic and Marxist rules. And if we Republicans were playing by the Marcus of Queensberry rules and the pulling your punches in a debate rules like we saw in prior election cycles, we were going to lose. And this is an existential threat to our future in this country. And so I uh, decided to support the president. And his style is actually, I think, the beginning of, you know, it's not everybody's style, but, uh, you know, I know my style as an attorney. And if you, if you don't fight back, uh, in every medium, you will lose. I mean, that's we're in a war here, in a cultural war. Um, you know, to Tammy's point about using the media, I do a lot of media for the party. I had an in interview with NPR on Saturday. What did you say, NPR? NPR. <laughs> yeah, I was well, checking. Oh my, I thought the, you uh, might have misspoken. The, the, uh, the, you know, I'm a surrogate, so that I was asked to speak to NPR. NPR started asking me questions, and the third question in, in a 10-minute interview was, "So, do you think Donald Trump owes?" Um, Mueller an apology for uh, all of his, and I started answering it and the host started interrupting me and I said, listen, don't interrupt me, let me finish. You inter invited me here and I'm going to finish what I had to say. And they then cut me off after that interview. But, <laughs> but hey, I don't think you're gonna be back on not, that channel again. I will not tolerate <laughs> being treated like that and I think everybody here in this room, if you're going to engage with the left, do not play by their rules. Play by the rules of decency. If you're invited somewhere and they ask you a question, mm -hmm. make sure you finish it and have what you have to say. We have to insist on our rights in this sphere. And if we're going to play by those, like I said, Marcus of Queensbury rules, we are going to lose every time. And so we cannot afford to lose the future of this country. This is the great American experiment. The reason my folks came here and brought me here and my brother here to this country was to enjoy those founding liberties. And they're easily dissipated. History has shown us that, and so we can't let that happen. Well, I, I hate to say it after your uh, great soliloquy on asking questions and giving answers. I'm going to have to disregard most of the questions you want to ask uh, just because of the limited time when we have seven minutes left. So uh, we can't really do lightning rounds on these. Mm. So I'll, maybe we'll just take one or two. Um, so how do we create a, bu a business culture that values both diversity and merit without elevating one at the expense of the other? C can I chime in that? That's true. The, the genuine meaning of affirmative action is the outreach regarding the opportunity. In Los Angeles, when it was uh, first a, a big deal, when it came, we wanted more women on the, on the LAPD, it wasn't about hiring women in a quota framework, but ads went up saying, look, this is a job. We want you to apply for this job. You can do this, too. It's the same with the military. Making sure, because certain sectors of society think, well, that can't be a job for me, or, or I, I wouldn't fit into that, or that, you know, subconsciously that's, a, that's a, a job for men. It is the outreach to make sure that everyone knows, yes, try this. Let's open the opportunity up for it. And of course, then the more women, the more people of color, the more individuals who maybe weren't involved in that kind of, a, a, of work, then uh, the pool goes up, and we're naturally going to have more people represented in, from those sectors of society that have been not represented. So it is a classic affirmative action, s being sincere about it and making sure that, that the outreach and the encouragement so that everyone has the opportunity to succeed uh, is, is that that's something that we're all uh, helping to facilitate. Well, I see blatant quotas being employed in our workplaces of places like the companies that I've sued and many other companies I haven't mentioned that I've sued. Um, they're all, they're all in, from banking, from finance, from you know, every major financial institution on down. They're all employing these quotas to satiate the mobs of leftists demanding their spoils. And I think we have to push back on that. So corporate leadership would be to say we will encourage, we will invite people to apply, and we will um, then judge people on their merit once they're in the door and they've had the opportunity and the training. But we have all kinds of artificial distortions in our market. So for example, why are there not more than 20% uh, um, software engineers in Silicon Valley who are female? Well, you know, the market is actually distorted by all the um, foreign workers we have who are being paid 50% of what the American workers are. So if, if 
American workers in Silicon Valley were being paid a non-distorted salary, you'd mm -hmm. actually see more people flo flooding into that and going to these STEM, uh, STEM style education in colleges. But instead, we were allowing kids to wallow in these victim studies uh, that, they, that they study in schools. We're not forcing them. I love the president's, uh, I was at the signing at the White House last week of his executive order that the, one, the part of it that got all the attention was about free speech on campus, which I'm very passionate about, but the other part that hasn't got the attention is sort of creating a market and the value of the loans that are tied to these worthless degrees that people are studying. And so if you're going to study women's studies or uh, you know minor and transgender studies or whatever it is, you're not gonna be able to get a loan for that, just as if you were trying to get a mortgage in a neighborhood and you're not gonna get the same mortgage loan to ratio if you're buying a teardown compared to buying a house that only needs a little bit of work. And I think that's really what we need to sort of insist on accountability. I, I just wanna emphasize that you're talking about Dartmouth and not Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> just as an employee of the state of California, I can't agree that our degrees are worthless. Or <laughs> I mean, that might be where they do take my tenure away. Um, <laughs> So They're not all worthless, but, <laughs> but I mean, John, you know, you and I both studied ancient Greek and Latin it's in college, true. and we so, went on to have productive, uh, productive careers nonetheless. Well, that's a, that's a but, judgment but, others can make for themselves. Uh, yes. uh, <laughs> mom is still wondering about the career choices. Um, oh, so I'm, the last question, uh, and I'm going to ask it because the handwriting is so beautiful, uh, which is a stark contrast to the effort to be provocative and disruptive. Uh, so. Do you believe President Trump has actually helped or hurt conservatives with his pushing back against identity politics using Twitter and rallies? This is an easy uh, one for me, but you, you go first. But I, but I mean, I think it goes back to the question, is that the way to fight back? But this yes. is a broader question. Is he helping yes. or hurting the conservative movement? Well, he's movement? obviously helping because he's opening up the conversation. He is disrupting what was going to be a status quo of leading us off the freaking cliff. Uh, he is the right man. At the, interestingly, in our history, we've always had the right man at the right time and soon the right woman at the right time, uh, that, these, that this is a divine framework. This nation is in a, a point really of no return. Donald Trump is showing us that, in fact, there, is, there can be change. We can disrupt uh, the status quo, but not just for the sake of it but because things, here's what we do as Americans. Here is really the American exceptionalism. Here is what the American experiment was meant to be, which was for everyone as, as a Republican, he identifies as a conservative, also as someone who is pro-life, someone though who is also recognizing and embracing the entire framework of who the American people are, who stood, stands up for himself, being constantly under attack, refusing to back down on the principle of what he stands for. This is what I've been speaking about regarding what conservatives must do. Uh, and it means also that the breadth of where we are politically. It's, it, there is a diversity in how, because of our lives are different, in how we approach these things politically, personally. Uh, and conservatism is about small government, trusting the individual to make choices that best suit them, that government is not the answer, that it has a certain kind of role, but a limited one when it comes to the issues of safety, taking the boot off of our neck so we can live our lives. That is also the classically liberal ideal, and it's the thing that can bring all Americans together, which is what Donald Trump is doing under the din of the legacy media that is still screaming that he's not. That's a lie. He is doing it, and uh, we're on the right road for a reformation. Yeah, um, I would have to also agree that I think that while his style is very different than what we see in many politicians, um, I am unabashedly a supporter of what he has accomplished because he is a fighter. He fought back against the left. Don't forget, and again, I'm from the perspective of a political figure, Politics is a zero-sum game, and the choice in 2016 is Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, and that was a foreordained choice. And you know, with respect to the other 16 candidates, none of them were going to be able to defeat Hillary Clinton. I think that was very clear pretty early on in the process. And so, I think that though what we take away beyond that particular 2016 election is fighting back is critical as conservatives and as a San Francisco Republican, I was chairman of the San Francisco <laughs> Republican Party. I'm that like was not the a heavily contested race. The most beleaguered. 
I'm sorry. Not fair, John. It's too easy. You live in Berkeley, so you should talk. But, um, but, but we've been living on our knees increasingly in California. We have been, you know, subordinated to this culture, and 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 he's taught us to fight back. So. I think that's what I take away from Donald Trump and the conservative movement. And the strength of, of conservatives okay, Tammy, and Republicans from California. I'm cutting you off. The <laughs> are these two individuals? <laughs> California is not lost. It is lost. Look, Don't is spend lost. any money. Oh, Don't move. No, it's it's game over. I can't think stop of a more it. fitting way to end our panel. <laughs> Join me in thanking Tammy and Harmeet.